Ladies and gentlemen, may I now invite on stage the new age historian, Dr. Vikram Sampat, to make us understand the significance of his quote that stood tall before all forms of criticism for his literary work in the form of the book in two volumes series, namely Savarkar, The Echoes from a Forgotten Past, and The Contested Legacy. Over to you, Dr. Sampat. Yellarigo Namaskara, Sanmanya Rajshri Taigore, Sachinji, Chaitanya Ji, Atu Illi Bandiro Ella Ganamanya Vektigalge, Nana Ritpurvaka Namaskara Guru. I come from Bangalore, so Ishtadru Kanada Matadi Nanu Belgavi Ellin and Prathama Pravasaidu. So I think it's my duty to start with the beautiful Kasturi Kanada. As I said, Thank you. As I said, this was my first visit ever to Belgavi. And you know, love always happens at first impression. And I think there, it's been love at first sight with your wonderful city. And the thanks, uh, deep gratitude and thanks for that is due to Prabuddha Bharat, Sachinji, Chaitanyaji, and all his committed team, uh, which has taken such good care of me in the last couple of years, ever since these books have come, I have gone to numerous places, uh, you know, giving talks uh, on Savarkarji, on various aspects of his life. But dare I say that I have never been uh, treated with this kind of warmth, almost like, you know, meeting members of my own family. So thank you very much uh, for this, Sachinji and Prabuddha Bharat. Even before the writing of the book, these two books, I embarked on this journey more than seven years ago. Uh, I must say that I was very, very diffident about taking up this uh, very huge challenge. As Rajshri Tai already mentioned, here is a man who is a multifaceted genius. He simultaneously means many things to many people. Uh, so I was not sure whether I had the capacity, I had the wherewithal to actually bring to all of you the story of his life. And during all such occasions, uh, the one person I would always go when I was in doubt was my mother, who was my uh, friend, philosopher, and guide. And uh, you know, she, though she was not a mountain climber of sorts, uh, she uh, gave me an advice which stayed with me all my life. She said, when you're climbing Mount Everest, you never look back and see how much you have covered. You don't look up and see how much more is left to traverse. Just keep taking one step at a time and before you realize, you reach the summit. Uh, and I think uh, that advice was very timely because while traversing a Mount Everest like Swatantravir Savarkar, if you keep looking at how much you have already covered or how much is left to do, it is not for the faint hearted to undertake a journey into his life. Uh, of course, my mother uh, was a Maharashtrian, so she was to be also my research assistant of sorts in this journey, helping me with translations and so on. Uh, but midway, we lost her. But I'm sure, uh, you know, some, wherever she is, uh, she would be smiling down and saying, for a change, my son has done a fairly decent job. She was very, very hard to please. Uh, this multifaceted genius that uh, Rajshri Tai had already alluded to, uh, means many things, as I said, simultaneously to many people. Uh, a few things which uh, I would illustrate are uh, a revolutionary, a daring revolutionary who started, and I'll elaborate on each of these as I try to take uh, you through the journey of his life. Of course, in Belagam, which also had a lot of connection with Savarkarji for the good and bad reasons, uh, the Hindu Mahasabha uh, adhivations, he had attended uh, many of them in Belagam. And also, uh, post-independence, he was also arrested here uh, when the Nehru Liyakat Ali Pact was signed and many members of the Hindu Mahasabha were put under bars uh, by uh, Nehru's government. Uh, he was kept in Belagavi for a couple of uh, months. So in a place like this, where there is a lot of, uh, you know, Maharashtrian influence, to talk about Savarkarji is like showing uh, Suraj ko Deepak dekhane ke saman hai. But still, uh, in the 45 minutes that I have at my disposal, I will try to take you through this journey of Mount Everest, the, the, the various landmarks of his life, and what it means to all of us today. Uh, a revolutionary par excellence is something that was a great discovery for me too, because when you think of revolution, 
the image that comes to mind is of a Marxist lineage. But here was a man who was not inspired by Karl Marx, thankfully, uh, and uh, uh, drew his inspiration from the Italian revolutionaries Mazzini and Garibaldi. Uh, he was born, this is his week of his 139th birth anniversary, he was born on 28th of May 1883 in this little village of Bhagur in Nashik uh, in Maharashtra to a very, very devout Chitpavan Brahmin family. Uh, his father Damodar Pant and mother Radhabai were someone who cultivated in the children, there were three sons, uh, the elder son Ganesh Damodar or Baba Rao, the middle one was Vinayak uh, and the younger one Narayan Rao and they had a sister too called Maina. In all the kids, they inculcated the sense of reading from a very, very young age. Reading not only literature from India, but from across the world. And I think that precociousness that uh, Savarkarji developed was thanks to these early formative years when uh, he read the philosophy of the entire world in a very, very short time. And by the time he was eight or nine, he had already started composing uh, Marathi poetry uh, of very high order with all the meters, the OV meter, the different meters that are followed in Marathi poetry, he began to, uh, it, it took a natural uh, you know, instinct in him. But tragedy also struck, the, struck this family very young, uh, early in life where Radhabai died quite early when Savarkarji was just about eight or nine years. And a few years later, another major catastrophe that was waiting to befall, not only their family, but almost the whole of Maharashtra, parts of India, where uh, the plague epidemic uh, raged. Uh, incidentally, the British the, you know, start, uh, uh, promulgated this uh, Epidemics Act, uh, which w has been in force in India now during the corona time. Uh, during that time, 1890s, uh, when plague hit different parts of India and Maharashtra was particularly uh, badly hit. Uh, unlike now, when the COVID warriors were going and helping the patients, the British didn't, were not interested in helping anybody to uh, get out of the uh, disease. They wanted to get uh, rid of the uh, epidemic as soon as possible, only so that the trade and commercial activities of India could carry on without any uh, you know, blocks. And for that reason, houses would be ransacked. Anybody who had, uh, you know, even a whiff of plague, the soldiers would take over their house, the puja ghars would be desecrated, women would be molested, and they would, all the patients, instead of being treated, they would be sent away to the city outskirts. Many of them died uh, without treatment and so on. And there was a rage all over Maharashtra about this. Even Bal Gangadhar Tilak uh, wrote in his Kesari that where is that Maika Lal who will stand up and take a stand against this? And the, they were not one, but three Maike Lal, the Chafikar Bandhus, uh, who picked up their gun and decided to shoot down uh, the plague commissioner of Pune uh, and his assistant. And that led to uh, fire across the whole Bombay presidency, because for the first time, there was a political assassination that was happening. After 1857 and the muzzling of the uh, Sipoy uh, uprising, there was never a time when uh, there was a uh, political assassination of a British uh, official, and this was happening now in under their watch in Pune. And so the traffickers were immediately caught. They were executed. And their heroism became folklore across Maharashtra. And young Savarkar, who was just about 11 or 12 years then, uh, was somewhere seeing all of this and imbibing all these images of the brave Chafekars who went to their noose with a smile on their lips and with verses of the Bhagavad Gita. And so moved was he that he sat in front of his family deity, the Ashtabhuja Bhavani, and took this very, very uh, you know, fierce oath, Shatrus Martha Martha Mare to Zunzen. You know, Till my last breath, I will Shatru ko marunga, khud nahi marunga, Shatru ko marunga. So it did seem like a very childish vow that a young, you know, about to be a teenager was taking, but he lived up to this uh, vow too. Shortly around this time, the same plague hit his father also after uh, losing his mother. A couple of years later, Damodar Panth also passed away due to plague. But despite these reverses, uh, Savarkar started India's first ever organized secret society, which was first called the Rashtra Bhakta Samuha. Later it became the Mitra Mela and much later changed its name to Abhinava Bharat. 
again, as I mentioned, inspired by the revolutionaries of Italy, young Italy that they formed there. Similarly, young India, Abhinav Bharat was established in, by the turn of the 20th century, around 1899-1900. What was the idea behind uh, these secret societies? It was to gather young people who were driven by a zeal for patriotism and for freedom and to inspire them not for what the Congress party then also was doing, that is small kind of concessions from the British government and so on, but actually look for total and complete freedom. And what was the route to gain that? Through an insurrection in the British Indian Army. And this, ladies and gentlemen, was the continuous theme of the armed struggle, the Sashastra Kranti uh, that was raged in this country. Unfortunately, in the larger narrative of our freedom struggle, this parallel story has been subsumed. We have all grown up listening to that uh, Hindi film song, De di hame azadi bina khadga bina bhal, sabarmati ke sant tune kar diya kamal. Of course, uh, the contribution of Mahatma Gandhi and the non-violent movement was immense to create that sense of mass awakening in Indians. But the final reason why we got our freedom was not due to a lot of the non-violent movements, as uh, historical records show, but a continuous and unending stream of armed rebellion, armed insurrections. Uh, so the, the British Sarkar was not the kind to whom you could very uh, politely go and say, please quit India and one day they'll get fed up and then leave India and go. Or they get so scared by someone making salt. Uh, so those were important, but the actual uh, thing that shook them from their wits was first 1857, that in your own British army, there is there are people who are, are uh, there's a gather, there's an uprising, and if that happens and that spreads across the country, there is no way that the Raj could be established. And the Congress was also established as that very safety wall, so to say, so that the repeat of 1857 cannot happen engage some members of the Indian community, you know, talk to them, give them an idea that, you know, we are taking your opinion also. The idea was never about getting freedom. At, in the early stages of the Congress, at least, it was formed by A.O. Hume, uh, who himself was uh, a British, uh, you know, official, a retired official, who incidentally, in the 1857 uh, time, he was a collector in one of the United Provinces places, he actually wore a burqa and had to run away to escape uh, from the rebels who were out to kill a lot of the Europeans. So in such a scenario, there was this revolutionary movement, which I think in this Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, it's very important for all of us to take that very dispassionate account as to what got India her freedom. And from 1857 to 1946, which was the naval mutiny of Bombay, uh, this unending stream, which I will talk uh, through in the rest of my speech as well, uh, was one of the main reasons why we got our freedom. And one of the people who uh, played a very, very major role in giving this revolution a sense of shape, a sense of intellectual corpus, and also a sense of strategy was Veer Savarkar through the Abhinav Bharat. Uh, the idea, as I said, was to create this uprising in the British Indian Army, smuggle weapons and so on from uh, the different parts of the world because you had uh, restrictions on being able to use weapons for Indians. So this, these were the main goals of the secret societies. Now, around 1905, Savarkar moved to Pune to the Ferguson College for his graduation, and the Abhinav Bharat began to spread across Maharashtra, starting with a small little uh, room in Nashik. It is still there. Those of you who go to Nashik, you can see that on the first floor of a room uh, of a house is where the Abhinav Bharat used to meet. Uh, very incidentally, if you come out of that place, the, the chalk that is there is called Nehru Chalk, even to this day. Uh, even that place is not named as Savarkar Chalk. Uh, so much to give credit for those who actually, uh, you know, sacrifice so much for our freedom. Uh, and here these people used to meet and they used to take this oath with the mythical sword of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj on which they all had to leave Argya. And this actual uh, text of this oath I actually found at the British Library in London where you know they say I commit my entire life, my, my head, my family, my everything to Bharat Mata and to surrender 
totally and unconditionally to her. And only those who uh, took that oath could become a part of this secret society. All the letters of that society would go with the exclamation of Swatantra Lakshmi ki jai. And that is why that beautiful song, which was rendered so beautifully by Kumari Shreya, uh, Jayostute Shri Mahan Mangale. So that became an anthem of sorts, which Savarkarji wrote when he was in Pune as a student in the Ferguson College. And around that time, you had the partition of Bengal. And to protest against what was happening in Bengal, you had Maharashtra uniting, where once again, the first ever student bonfire of foreign clothes was organized in Pune by Savarkar. Again, something that, you know, you talk of uh, um, bonfire and the image comes of Mahatma Gandhi. But much before Gandhiji even came on the Indian scene in 1905 uh, was the first bonfire and for which Savarkar was actually rusticated from college. He had to even pay a fine uh, to, the, uh, to the principal and uh, but they continued and that time he came into close contact with his uh, gurus, two gurus. One is of course Lokmanya Tilak and the other was the Karl newspapers SM Paranspe. Uh, with their support uh, and their recommendation, uh, he was given a letter to go to study in London. And in London, you had this, uh, uh, again, a very lesser known, uh, under profile kind of a person who probably till recently, many of us in India did not even know, Shamji Krishna Verma. Uh, till uh, Sri Narendra Modi, when he was the chief minister of Gujarat, he actually brought his uh, Shamji Krishna Verma's ashes back to uh, Gujarat because he belonged to Gujarat. Uh, he was a divan in some of the princely states and got so disillusioned, went away to uh, uh, you know uh, London. He was a Oxford scholar, a great uh, you know journalist who was starting this magazine called the Indian Sociologist. Uh, and he was also creating a parallel movement outside India for complete liberation of the country. And that is again a very important point to note that the early revolution, uh, revolutionary movements always happened outside of India because the colonial laws in India, uh, the anti-sedition laws and so on were so strong that if you did a lot of activity here, you would immediately be arrested. But in Europe, you could carry it out with more uh, you know, freedom. You could be anti-government at the same time, no one was going to penalize you. And so Shamji was inviting young budding talents national, uh, who were fired with a nationalistic zeal to come to London uh, under a scholarship, ostensibly to study, but alongside do seditious activities. And Savarkar got the uh, Shivaji scholarship to go there and study law. And in those five years that he was in London, uh, they were the stormy years which uh, contributed immensely to the freedom movement in India. And again, unsung heroes of our freedom struggle whom our history textbooks probably don't even talk about. Along with Shamji Krishna Verma, you had Madam Bhikaji Kama, um, Virendranath Chattopadhyay, uh, VVS Ayer, MPT Acharya, Lala Hardayal, who later formed the Gadar Party. Uh, many such people. It was almost a microcosm of India. From different parts of India, there were these young men who had come there to study, but simultaneously were doing all these other activities. Senapati Bapat uh, from Pune as well. And these people in the India house that they lived in, that became a hotbed of sedition uh, for the British. And the British kept constant uh, surveillance on the activities that were going on in this house. Now, in those five years, Savarkar contributed to various aspects of the revolution, and I shall list some of them. One was to provide an intellectual corpus, as I said, to revolution. How do we look at revolution uh, in our popular parlance? They were hot-blooded young men who threw a bomb here and there, killed somebody, and they were then hanged. That's all. It's a footnote in our history. But there was, that was not what it was. There was a lot of uh, strategy involved. There was a lot of intelligence that went into this. And that intellectual corpus, as I said, was provided by Savarkar through two books that he wrote. One was, of course, the, uh, the translation of Mazzini, the Italian revolution, uh, revolutionary Joseph Mazzini's biography into Marathi. And the other seminal work that he did was on the 1857 uh, uprising something that he started calling the first war of Indian independence. Uh, 
Uh, till then, the British called it a sepoy mutiny. That few, you know, sepoys, because of the beef and pork lard, uh, they did not want to uh, bite off the cartridge, and that's why they uh, went up in Bagavat. But Savarkar, using two years, staying in London, using the British records against them, and to rewrite history from an Indian perspective, put out the facts before the nation about what this first war of Indian independence actually was, that it was actually not a sporadic uh, uprising, but it was a full-scale revolution that was waiting to happen, and there was a larger strategy for that, uh, the insurrection in the army. Again, the common theme was that, which I shall lead you through till the end of my talk. Uh, and this book, ladies and gentlemen, became again, there were so many firsts to Savarkar's life. This book too was the first book in the history of world literature which was banned even before it was published. The British were so scared of this book that uh, they were keeping uh, surveillance around the India house. So there were spies inside who were uh, stealing copies of this manuscript and giving it to the British government. And in my research, I've actually found uh, you know, jottings of uh, Winston Churchill, who was the Home Secretary, the Viceroy of India, uh, all of them saying that this book should not come to India at any cost because they knew it was explosive material. And, but these revolutionaries had a very, very unique way of ensuring that they not only seditious material literature, but also guns, uh, bombs, all of this could come to India. This manuscript, for example, in 1857, it has a history of itself. Uh, first, the manuscript, which was written in Marathi, was sent to Baba Rao, Savarkar's elder brother, and he took it to Sholapur to get it published. Uh, somehow the British got to know there was a chapa, police chapa on the uh, printing press. The manuscript was hurriedly withdrawn, sent back to London. From London, they sent it to France, uh, to Paris to get it published. The French police were activated. They also, uh, you know, uh, put a chapa on the press. So it was hurriedly withdrawn from there. From there, it went to Germany uh, because Germany had a lot of Indology specialists, and they would know the Devanagari script in which the book was written in Marathi. They thought Germany would be a good place to uh, publish it, but the typesetter made a mess of the whole manuscript. So again, it was withdrawn from there. Then it went to Belgium which is where uh, Vivius Iyer, one of his accomplices, also translated it to English. So both the English and Marathi books that way managed to get published. And these were sent back to India in these false bottom boxes. They were double barrel boxes. The bottom barrel, you had all the seditious material, you had guns, you had uh, bombs, all of that uh, there. And on the top, it would be you know, Christmas presents, something else put there somehow to circumvent customs across different countries. And this way, these things were smuggled to India, including a bomb manual. So Savarkarji sent Senapati Bapat and also from the Anushilan Samiti. That is what I was talking about, a, uh, a strategy. So Anushilan Samiti, Ugantar, etc., which was in Bengal, uh, secret societies in Bengal, they formed an alliance with the Maharashtra secret society and together they wanted to create a bomb manual, how to make bombs and ensure that these go off in different places. You didn't know how to make bombs in those days in India. So there also Senapati Bapat and Anushilan Samiti's Hemchandra Das Kanungo, they were sent by Savarkar to find out about the bomb manual. Now they found this with a Russian uh, tailor, uh, you know, in uh, somewhere around Eastern Europe. Now they took the manuscript and Hemchandra was a great photographer, so he took all the photographs quickly. Later they realized the entire bomb manual is written in Russian. So Kala Akshar Bhais Barabar kuch samaj mein nahi aara, what do we do? Then Senapati Bapat had a very uh, ingenious idea. Now he had a Russian girlfriend. Now revolutionaries also were colorful people. They were not just looking at, uh, you know, uh, creating sedition, but he had a girlfriend called Miss Amaya who was studying in Berlin, uh, her MBBS. So he went to her and this lady took six months to make, uh, to translate this uh, entire 70 pages of the bomb manual into English. And then it was put into different this Marathi, Bengali, and again smuggled back to India, along with also these browning pistols and uh, bombs and so on. Now, uh, that those 
manuals found their way to Tilak, they found their way to Bengal, to Aurobindo Ghosh, uh, to his brother Barin Ghosh, Prafulla Chaki, all those people who were involved in the Alipur bomb, the Manitola bomb case, uh, the bomb manuals as well as the um, weapons started going there. And there was the explosions waiting to happen in different parts of India. You had the Manitola bomb case. And in Nashik, inspired by this entire zeal of Abhinav Bharat, a young man, Anant Lakshman Kanhere, he shot dead the uh, district collector of uh, uh, Nashik, AMT Jackson. And the revolution had come right into the British uh, Sultanate, right under their nose. And as if this was not enough, back in uh, London, uh, Madanlal Dhingra, one of Savarkar's acolytes, shot dead Lord Curzon Wiley, who, who was you know, doing the surveillance on Indian students. So in the heart of the empire, an Indian, young Indian student had picked up a gun, gun, learned how to use the gun, and also gone and shot a British officer. And back in India, bombs were being thrown at the Viceroy Lord Harding, which uh, Rash Bihari Bose did. There was this Manitola case, there was the uh, Nashik uh, conspiracy case, the murder of Jackson and the British were alarmed. So they had to wake up and see what is going on. And when they connected all the dots, the, one of the sources for that in India was Baba Rao and the Abhinav Bharat. So he was quickly uh, caught and sent, tried and sent away to Kalapani in the Andamans. But connecting the dots, they went back to London. There was this puny little man who probably never held a gun in his entire life. And for a writer like me, it's very uh, interesting to know that this pen is mightier than the sword, uh, that the British were mortally scared of this man, that they gave him this D category or dangerous category criminal. His words were so powerful. His literature was so dangerous, though he never took up a gun himself. So they said at any cost, this man needs to be extradited to India. Because in, if the trial had happened in um, London, somehow they would have escaped. Uh, you know, as I said, the colonial uh, the laws were not so strong there. You could be anti-government. Uh, so, but then for that reason, this man had to be extradited to India. Uh, they put up several false cases against him. Uh, there was no clear link to show that it was he who sent the Browning pistols, but still uh, th this case was put. And as um, Rajshriji mentioned, uh, during the extradition, when he was being brought back to India, the ship docked for a while at the French port of Masai. Uh, and there were two guards all the time with him, keeping surveillance there too. He was after all a D category criminal. So even if he had to go to the uh, toilet, there would be two people who would follow him. He was not allowed to uh, close the door that had to be kept little open so that uh, nothing happens to him. But despite all this, when it was stopping at Maasai, uh, this man daily was observing, as she mentioned, the porthole of the lavatory. And he realized that this is the only time I can jump out and escape. And there also a very um, uh, you know, judicious lawyer that he was, he knew that if he jumped out, the ship was now in France, if he jumped, swam a few kilometers, got onto French soil, then the French laws would be uh, you know, valid upon him and not the British laws anymore. So uh, this was the ideal way to play a legal uh, case against the British. And so he took this daring, jumped out, swam a bit, came to the uh, other side. It was a comedy of errors, unfortunately. He caught a French policeman and said, please take me to the local magistrate. Now he was talking in English. The uh, French guy did not understand English. Savarkar did not know French. By then, the British soldiers who were standing outside got alerted. They came running saying, thief, thief, catch him. And somehow the French people thought this was a petty thief. So they caught him and brought him back to uh, the ship. The case was that Madam Bhikaji Kama, Virendra Chattopadhyay, all of them were coming there at a particular place in a car to take him there and go away. But like it happens in Bollywood films, uh, they were late by a few minutes. And so in that uh, tragic consequence of that, he was brought back to the ship. And uh, that is when he composed another poem, Anadi Me Anantami, uh, another very, very famous Marathi poem. He almost 
talking a snook at those people saying you can capture me physically but i am immortal anadi ananta my soul is something that you cannot capture so but this entire episode of jumping there and getting onto french soil that became a a, a very important case between britain and france in the international court of justice at hague just like the kulbushan uh, jadhav case that is going on between india and pakistan so france and britain were both fighting for this person the they were, the french government was under immense pressure that it's an attack on your sovereignty how can britain come and take away a person who has sought asylum on our soil they cannot do this so we need to uh, it's it's a attack on our dignity as a nation and france has always been known for liberty equality fraternity so we need to live up to that in fact the french government fell as a result of the unpopularity that it got in this case but even then if you see the british records they say at any cost let's you know uh, somehow make the french subdue them and get this man back to india and eventually they prevailed uh, even as the trial was going on he was brought to india the trial was uh, conducted he was not even given a jury uh, to or a right to appeal so it was a fixed match already the outcome was known and he was given what was probably one of the most harshest punishments other than execution of course of two life imprisonments uh, one life imprisonment accounting for 25 years so 25 plus 25 50 long years a young man who was just 27 years old then who had gone with dreams in his eyes of becoming a lawyer from the grays in in uh, london caught there for 50 years so if he came out alive he would be 77 and the british had always put this patta on their uh, neck saying 1960 uh, saying you know that is the year your actually 1910 was when he was captured so 1960 he would come out every day you had to see that to realize when you are going to come out of the jail but it is said to his credit that even in the court Uh, when the verdict was pronounced and the the judge asked do you have anything to say mr savarkar he supposed to have got up and said no my lord uh, i i am very happy that the british have finally understood and acknowledged the hindu uh, philosophy of reincarnation because if there are two life transportations i have to go through i have to come for another life so that means you know you have also somewhere accepted that there is punarjanam so that was the kind of man that he was made of uh, not uh you know shaken by something as fierce as this and then we move to the next phase of savarkar's life which is the 11 years in kalapani the the hell hole the indian bastille where the worst kind of tortures were inflicted not only on him but several other revolutionaries all those bengal revolutionaries were also hold there barin ghosh ulaskar dat uh, indu bhushan roy again names which don't strike a bell in any of us today when we talk of our freedom struggle the basic human facilities human rights not given to them today you know uk and other countries they talk about human rights but the kind of atrocities that they committed on our forefathers on our freedom fighters i think they need to uh, you know uh, apologize several times not only for the jallianwala bag massacre but also the kind of tortures that they committed in cellular jail where no jail manuals worked as rajshree ji mentioned the food was served with uh, pieces of reptiles and insects and all of that eating that most of them would end up with diarrhea and there were fixed timings to go to the restroom also so i mean diarrhea if you had to repeatedly go to the toilet you were not allowed so most of the political prisoners they defecated in their own cells and sitting amidst your own squalor uh, eating sleeping Uh, you know and standing there with handcuffs standing handcuffs for weeks on end where you had to urinate defecate as you stood this was the kind of torture that they got and that dreaded uh, torture of kolhu uh, ka punishment where uh, they were yoked to the oil grinding mill and instead of a bull that was there to do the uh, kolhu you had the freedom fighter who was there and every day in the blazing heat of port blair they had to go round and round this kolhu to extract 30 pounds of oil and at the end of the day this would be measured and if the oil did not measure up you were whiplashed you were not given dinner and so on and they were given 
rough gunny sacks to wear, uh, which caused skin rashes, skin diseases, and all of that, but no medical treatment given. And like was mentioned, no paper and pen. There were others who wrote letters to a daughter, letters to so many people and all that, and that became books. But here you had a freedom fighter who was not even given uh, paper and pen, but he said, it's OK. I'm, I will use either you know, my nails or a piece of charcoal to etch poetry and um, you know on the walls and the 6,000 verses of Kamala, Saptarishi, uh, epoch-making poems in Marathi literature that were written on the walls of this cell. And to spite him, Barry, who was the uh, jailer, in front of him he would come and whitewash the walls with all the poetry. But little did he know that here was a man who had an elephantine memory. All these verses were committed to memory. And so after coming out, they got published not because they were written somewhere, but they were already inscribed in his head. So that was the precociousness of uh, this person that we're talking about. And from such a you know, terrible conditions in jail. Savarkar uh, also heralded a lot of jail reforms. Uh, so there was another phase in the jail where all the prisoners, they were starting to teach each other, um, you know, Indian languages to, to, to create national unity. Uh, the Bengali prisoner would teach Bengali to the Maharashtrian, someone would teach Tamil. So this way there was uh, to create this unity among all the Indians. And it was in jail that Savarkar's new phase also came in, which was that of Hindutva. And there was again, ladies and gentlemen, a context to why uh, he propounded this philosophy. One was, of course, the experiences in the jail. Uh, you know, here was a man who, when he wrote his 1857 book, he had said, India is a rainbow of colors, uh, where the Hindu is the dominant color, but then all others, the Muslims, the Christians, the Jains, the Parsis, they're all different part. And to have this uh, samagra, uh, you know, rainbow for India, you need to have all the colors. But from that, there was a transition uh, first, you know, start with the experiences in the jail, where to to create dissensions among the prisoners, the British always put the Muslim Pathans as the Jamadars or the head of the jail. And they were the ones who were giving all these tortures. And anybody who said, will you convert to Islam, uh, you know, their punishment would be reduced. So to get over those tortures that I spoke about, like, what difference does it make whether you say Ram or Allah, just get rid of the punishment. So many people would cross over to uh, the other side of the religious divide uh, in the jail. And uh, Savarkar saw this uh, happening in front of him. And that's why he also started the Shuddhi movement. So those of them who later repented and wanted to come back to the Hindu fold, there was no mechanism in the Hindu religion to actually take these people back because Hinduism is not a proselytizing religion. So drawing from the Arya Samaj and Swami Dayanand Saraswati's uh, Shuddhi movement, he started this, that those who wanted to come back with a little argya and uh, tulsi kapatta, some verses from the Bhagavad Gita, you could become a Hindu again. And this was actually opposed by the Hindus more than anyone else, uh, the orthodox Hindus within the jail. So this was one um, uh, you know, event which changed his perspective to how he looks at his own faith, his religion, and how it stands in relation to the other religions, particularly the Abrahamic ones, which look at uh, a predatory, proselytizing uh, kind of a worldview. The other important thing that was happening in the country then was the Khilafat agitation. And I'm sure a lot of you know about it, but then just to summarize it, here was a movement which was doomed for failure right from the very start. Because what was the Khilafat? The, 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 the way with words, Khilafat, you feel ang Angrezon ke Khilaf uh, hui ek, um, a movement, but it was not that. It was the caliphate movement, where uh, the pan-Islamist caliphate, uh, to establish that, uh, Gandhiji started this entire movement and then yoked the non-cooperation also to it. But what exactly was it that Turkey was actually conquered by Britain in war, in the First World War. And the people of Turkey themselves were fed up of the caliph. They wanted Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, who came in in a democratic way there. But here, a group of Muslims were considering the caliph as a very uh, you know, holy figure, because he was a, a successor of the holy prophet. And so they were being mobilized on this basis, saying, if you participate in the non-cooperation movement, we will give you support to 
uh, establish a caliphate in Turkey. Now you imagine this was a country that was won in war. India was a slave nation. Here a few people raise kala jhandas and say, we want you to put a king of our choice in that country which you have won. Why on earth would the British ever do that? Uh, but then they were being mobilized on this in a very, very dangerous communal fashion. And uh, uh, there the patriotism of a group was being sought or bartered, saying, you do this, in return I will do this. So, and obviously, and Gandhiji had also made this commitment that in one year of launching this movement, both a caliphate will be established and Purana Swaraj will be got for India. Now, obviously, both of it did not happen. And we are talking of 1919, 1920. Obviously, not getting Swaraj, people said, okay, let's keep trying. But then the failure of the Khilafat movement ensured that there was a wave of Hindu genocides that happened in different parts of India, starting with the Mopla uh, uprising in Malabar in 1921. There were riots in Kohat, Panipat, Gulbarga, uh, Calcutta, Delhi, and so on. Um, they were politic they were assassinations too. The Arya Samaj, uh, Swami Shraddhanand was actually uh, murdered by a Muslim fanatic called Abdul Rashid. And during all these occasions, the response of the Congress and particularly of Mahatma Gandhi was extremely pusillanimous. Uh, when the Mopla carnage happened, he called the Moplas as brave patriots who were fighting for the cause of their religion. When Swami Shraddhanand was assassinated, he said, my dear brother Abdul Rashid, uh, I do not consider him as an assassin at all. We need to get into the psyche of the assassin to understand why he picked up the gun and shot at him. Of course, it was a tragic irony that Two decades later, when Godse picked up the gun and shot the same man who said, we need to get into the psyche of a person who assassinates, Gandhians did not say, my dear brother Godse, and try to understand what was his psyche uh, in assassinating Gandhiji. Uh, heinous crime nonetheless. So, but this was the response that Gandhi was providing. So, in the looking at all of this, in the jail in Ratnagiri that he was in 1923, Savarkar said the Hindus are being led to their doom. Uh, there has to be an intellectual counter to this madness that they were being led to. It was disaster. And that was when he wrote his slim book, Essentials of Hindutva. Um, and most of his other works were in Marathi, but this book was in English, very strategically. So it was very strategically for a pan-Indian audience and not just for Maharashtrians to read. And there he expounded what his concept of Hindutva was. Hindutva or Hinduness, uh, he said right at the beginning that this is not linked to the religion of Hinduism. Uh, it has no concerns with the theological, otherworldly, spiritual aspects of uh, Hinduism or the puja paddhatis, rituals. He said there are lots of uh, Swamiji's and Guruji's and others who will do all this. We are looking only at a cultural and a nationalistic identity marker, so to say, where who is a Hindu? He's, he can be, he or she can be a Muslim, Christian, Jew, Parsi, a Hindu by faith, which is what he or she would be f following in his home. But culturally and nationally, anybody who lives between the Sindhu uh, Nadi, the Indus River and the ocean, who considers this land as his Punya Bhumi and Pitru Bhumi, uh, Punya Bhumi, holy land, again, not in terms of holy because it has your places of worship or whatever, but also you owe your allegiance to it. Uh, you know, you don't think of Turkey and its sultan as your reason to work for your country. So you consider this land as your uh, land of allegiance. That is your Punya Bhumi and Pitru Bhumi, the land of your ancestors. There too, I mean, the Marxist, uh, you know, change of words. They say Pitru Bhumi, that is actually fatherland. So actually it is such a Nazi concept of being a fatherland. India has always been called the motherland. So that is again a wrong interpretation of what Pitru Bhumi is. Pitrus are our ancestors. We have the Pitru Paksha uh, where we uh, show obeisance to them. So anybody who considers this land, they may be following any religion they will be thought of as Hindus culturally and nationally. And he also says there that, you know, people like Annie Besant or Sister Nivedita, who, for whom this land was not the land of their ancestors, 
what will they be called they would also be culturally and nationally called hindus because they have probably contributed much more to this country than indigenously born hindus uh, here for whom it's their pitrubhumi so it, it is a highly misunderstood concept that it is anti any particular religion or whatever it was more to give this idea that you need to have your allegiance to this land and then the next phase of savarkar's life starts where he starts implementing all these aspects of hindutva in action once he's released in 1924 on two conditions the first condition was for the next 5 years he is not going to participate in politics and also the second condition was he is going to stay limited to the ratnagiri district in maharashtra at any cost he could not go beyond that so his actions were restricted he was constantly under surveillance people say you know he had sold out those infamous petitions that he signed he had sold his soul he had become a british stooge now if you imagine uh, somebody who has sold out to you the british were not foolish not to utilize someone who has sold his soul to you he was a very intelligent person he was a useful person for the british so they would have co-opted him but every time his uh case came up for a review that can we lift the restrictions the five years kept increasing by every 2 to 2 to 2 years five years finally became 13 long years so 11 years in kalapani three years in indian jails which was 14 years of imprisonment and 13 long years of conditional house arrest in ratnagiri so 27 long years of a young man's life snuffed out just like that and but in ratnagiri at least he had the idea, he had the freedom to put those ideas of hindutva and what it meant theoretically into practice and that is where the social reformer in savarkar came he realized that the hindu society was broken into so many castes and sub castes and so on the untouchability asprashyata that had to be taken away and so if you had to stand up as one united force these divisions had to go and so that is why he came up with this very famous you know seven bandis or the shackles that held the hindu society they are the first bandi was vedokta bandi uh, the vedas are not the preserve of one particular community it is universal knowledge so it needs to be universalized to everyone the sanskrit and the vedic literature has to be given to everyone and he said if the yagyopavit is the one that is the preventive it's a passport to get to the vedas let me as a chitpavan brahmin give that yagyopavit to everybody so you know there's a uh, constructive the same movements that were happening in south india the periyar movement and so on where people were going and cutting off uh, people's uh, yagyopavits that is one way of ensuring this uh, you know the anti brahmin feeling that was there the other way is to ensure that everyone gets it then nobody is superior the brahmin is not superior the so called untouchable is not inferior everyone has it everyone gets access to what is truly indic knowledge so that was the vedokta bandi that he uh, you know spoke about this shackle had to go that was the first shackle the second was vyavsay bandi that is profession uh, you know you could be uh, the, this is not inherited you know dynastic rule is not a part of uh, savarkar's world view uh, it is based on merit and you could be born in any commu uh, community but if you had the merit you could take up a profession of your individual choice so vyavsay bandi had to be removed and interestingly at around the same time a group of so called untouchables go to gandhi ji and they say you know we want to aspire for political uh, office and so on and gandhi actually shides them this is 1931 he says everybody cannot become a viceroy or a prime minister you have to be born in a particular uh, family a group to actually aspire for uh, for political office you know today we have a situation where even a chai wala can become a prime minister and that is what is the uh, fundamentals of democracy but here was a thought process which said that you know you needed to be born in a particular group to aspire for something so vyavsay bandi had to go then sparsh bandi untouchability not looking at just uh, you know removal of untouchability but a complete eradication of caste including the varna system so and which is where 
Savarkar's views and Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar's views actually coincide, where Ambedkar also writes to him saying, you are the only one who has understood that it is the Varana system which is at the root cause for all these jatis and upajatis and so on, and that needs to be eradicated. Because at the same time, again, quoting Gandhiji, he said, I do not consider the Varana system or the jati pratha as odious. In fact, the edifice of Hinduism will come crashing if we change anything about that. So at that time, there were these two men who had a different view, Savarkar and Ambedkar. So uh, Sparshabandi, the untouchability is one part, but complete annihilation of the caste uh, system is what they were looking at. Shuddhi Bandi, so the shackle of not letting people into your uh, uh, fold, that should go. Samudra Bandi, the whole idea that if you cross the seas, you will lose your caste. That also was something that he did not believe in. His book also that he wrote was Shatruncha Shibirat. So go to the enemy's camp, learn their tricks, and use it against them only. You know, so Shatru ke ghar mein ghus ke unko maro, something that we hear nowadays uh, when Balakot happens or anything else happens. The roots of that were here, the Shatruncha Shibirat. You go there and don't say if you cross the seas, you will lose your caste. You should use every opportunity to gain the knowledge from across the world and use it for your people, your country, and so on. Then the last two bandis were Roti Bandi and Beti Bandi, the intercaste dining, intercaste marriage. Uh, he started the first ever cafe in India. Again, one more first ever. If we start noting down how many first ever, there would be several of them. This was the first ever intercaste dining cafe in Ratnagiri. Now, at a time when even among the Maharashtrian Brahmins, the Deshasthas and the Konkanasthas would not sit together and eat, here was a radical situation where the Mahars, the, the lowest of the community, the Mangs, all of them were asked to sit together and eat, which was a huge uh, backlash that he faced for that. He started the Asprishya Ganesh Otsav, where the, the lowest of the so-called caste order, he would be the officiating priest, and even the Brahmin had to go and take his blessings to offer his uh, you know, devotion to Ganpati. So taking Tilak's Ganesh Otsav to another uh, you know, level of um, uh, uniting Hindu society. Uh, the Patit Pavan Mandir, as Raj Sriji mentioned, of the first ever temple where people of all castes and communities could enter. And even when they were going there, he uh, that Marathi poem saying, let me, give me a darshan of God. Uh, you know, all of them sang that, don't create these false walls between me and my maker. The, all the castes and communities sang with tears coming from their eyes. Uh, climbed the steps of this temple and offered their prayers. So, uh, and schools also, in those days, uh, the so-called untouchable children had to sit outside the classes. Now the teacher, if some of them were errant, they would not even go and touch them to beat them from outside, from inside the class, a chalk piece would be thrown at them. So at such a situation, Savarkar propounded for uh, all children to sit together and study. So you can imagine in these 13 years, the kind of social experiments that were done, uh, though it limited as a pilot project to Ratnagiri, uh, that really created shackles, I mean, shake, shook the system completely. And he got more enemies only because of that. I think the orthodox Hindus were as much against him as was also the Congress uh, and other parties, because people could not take the uh, the scale of reforms. Reforms needed to be done piecemeal, uh, you know, like what Gandhiji understood the pulse of the people. So Harijan Udhar, that is first done, then step by step you do. But here was a dismantling of the entire edifice that Savarkar was talking about, which took a long time for people to assimilate. The next stage in his life was when he got out of jail in, I mean, uh, house arrest in 1937, and he became the president of the All India Hindu Mahasabha. Even then, the Congress actually, when he came out, it was a no-brainer that he was so popular, so he would join the Congress. And uh, there are reports which I have quoted in my books of how everyone from Nehru to Subhash Chandra Bose, who was the president of the Congress then, writing to him saying, please join the Congress. But he's supposed to have said that I would rather prefer to be in the last row of the patriots than in the first row of the traitors. And uh, <laughs> so the, according to him, the Congress at that time had gone so far 
ahead in Muslim appeasement, uh, the, the uh, uh, portents of uh, partition were striking the door. So he said, I'm not going to join such a party. I will be completely throttled. And the manner in which any difference of opinion is uh, subdued in the Congress and Gandhi had almost become a very autocratic leader of the Congress. He said, I cannot survive in such a place. So I will take on the Hindu Mahasabha, which by then was a, it was a decrepit party. Hardly many members had multiple membership with the Congress. But despite that, he made it an electorally fit party, which gave uh, equal tucker to both the Congress as well as the Muslim League, which were the only two major political parties. And from 1935, if you recall, you had the Government of India Act. And so elections, provincial elections had begun in all over India. So you needed parties to mobilize and start these campaigns. And so that was the next phase of Savarkar's life, where he toured the entire country, made the Hindu Mahasabha a major competitor, and also gave a manifesto as to what he envisioned for a free India. In the Hindu Mahasabha, with its various leaders, Shama Prasad Mukherjee and others, his main protege, uh, was advocating what would ideally be called a secular India. Un, quite contrary to what people portray the Hindu Mahasabha as a communal organization, uh, what was his, his speeches as the president of the Hindu Mahasabha in this uh, uh, um, uh, 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 um, Hindu Rashtra Darshan, that his compilation of all his speeches as the president of the Hindu Mahasabha, he says, my conception of this Hindu Rashtra or the Hindu nation, which again is not linked by religion, but the Hinduness of the people culturally and nationally is one where all citizens are equal. The majority community will not get any extra privileges only because they are more in number. The minorities will not get any extra concessions because they are less in number. In the eyes of the law, everybody is the same. You can do your puja paddhati, your namaz, etc. in your house, but that is not to be interfered into the public space. And he also goes on to say in his speeches, uh, you know, that if the minorities of India have even a ghost of suspicion in their mind that their religious, their cultural and their linguistic rights will be infringed upon by the Hindu Rashtra, uh, they should take away all these suspicions. And the Hindu Rashtra will en en uh, work towards ensuring these encroachments are not done and everybody will be equal in the eyes of the law. Nobody is one man, one vote, uh, you know, there's equality for everybody. So I don't understand what more is the conception of a secular state, uh, if that term can be used for this. But still, you know, the opponents then kept calling this political organization uh, um, a communal one because it used the word Hindu, that is somehow, uh, you know, anathema. Uh, and those very difficult years leading to the Quit India movement, where people said he did not participate in it and he stayed away from it. Naturally, I mean, even in the Congress, there was so much of opposition to the Quit India movement that here was a movement that was launched without any thought process. Uh, and this do or die that was given as a call, it meant different things to different people. The Quit India later became a very, very uh, violent movement too, because within a week of it being announced, the entire Congress leadership, including Gandhiji, were all taken and put away into jails, the Aga Khan Palace, and different places. So there was no leader to this movement. And that actually led to the underground movement gathering steam. So the army, uh, the, the same theme that I spoke of right at the beginning, the army insurrections that started going around. And at the same time, you had Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, who was, who was literally kicked out of the Congress. He meeting Savarkar in 1940, and Savarkar is supposed to have told him that uh, there is no point doing these mass movements. Shatru ka shatru dost hota hai, to you go and ally with the Axis powers who are fighting against the British. So uh, through Savarkar, there's a lot of connection which I explore in my book of Savarkar, Rash Bihari Bose, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose coming together. And through that, Bose goes away first to Germany, meets Hitler, he's disillusioned. Then he goes to Southeast Asia, and where Rash Bihari Bose has already formed the INA, the Indian National Army or Azad Hind Forge, and then the rest is history. So many of the Soldiers who were, uh, you know, uh, tried during the INA trials, they also say, we were, we entered the British Indian Army on the advice of Barrister Savarkar and later on defected to INA. Uh, so the 
his idea of militarization of Hindus was for this purpose, that one is the Hindus also learn the art of warfare at a time when partition was imminent. And, you know, in the case of a civil war between the two major communities of India, one of them is armed, while the other one has been made so pusillanimous because of nonviolence for so many decades, you needed military training to protect yourself. So that was one uh, reason for militarization. The other was, how can you train people and make them defect to the INA, uh, which is what eventually happened. And finally, 1946, uh, even after Netaji's sudden disappearance and all of that, we don't know whether he died then or he was, uh, he went away somewhere, that conspiracy theory will keep on going on. But the naval mutiny of 1946, that was the last nail in the coffin of the British Raj, where ideally, you see, we still call it the naval mutiny. Uh, if it was 1857 was not Sepoy mutiny, but the first war of Indian independence, this should be the last war of Indian independence because it broke out in February 1946. And within a couple of weeks of it breaking out, the British sent their cabinet mission plan to India to negotiate transfer of power. Uh, because they were petrified that, you know, if the army goes up in revolt, they cannot hold ground. At the time of the first, uh, Second World War, the number of soldiers in the British Indian Army was about two and a half million. Out of that, for, only 40,000 were Europeans. The rest of them were Indians. Now imagine, even if 10% of this large number were seduced to patriotism and they went up in arms, the British was no way, they'd already lost the second, I mean, they'd uh, won the Second World War, but their economy was shattered. There was lots of problems there. Their biggest colony, which was India, if there was an army uprising, there was no way they could uh, tolerate that. And so Mountbatten was clearly given the directive that from that wreckage, you try to salvage as much as possible and come back to India. And that's why they came back in a haste. Uh, they were actually supposed to give us independence somewhere in 1948, June or July. But one year earlier, they, in a haste, it was done. And that's why there was not much planning about the partition and so on, which was uh, done, the, the, the Narsanghar that followed uh, this era. All that was because of this. And they, they left uh, the shores of India. Uh, so once again, I go back to that original theme of this armed uprising and why that was so important in the attainment of our freedom. And this is not something that I am saying. You know, there is someone, none less than Lord Clement Attlee, who was the Prime Minister of Britain, when transfer of power happened to India, he comes to India in the 1950s. Uh, to Calcutta, he stays with this uh, Justice Pani Bhushan Chakraborty, who was the acting governor of Bengal and also the justice, uh, chief justice of the Bengal High Court. And Chakraborty asked Atli, why did you leave us in a haste and go? Uh, you know, what was the reason? Because that's a mystery for all of us, that why did you give us independence when none of us expected it? And Atli is supposed to have said, and Chakraborty notes it in his memoirs that it was the insurrection in the army, the heroics of INA and Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose that really shook us from our wits. Chakraborty further pushes it a little more and said, what about the Quit India movement and the nonviolent struggle of Gandhi? How much did it influence your final decision to transfer power? And with a smirk on his face, according to Chakraborty, he says, me ni mal. So that was his word when he said what was the impact of that era. Not again trying to disparage any movement and its importance, but we need to understand at least after 75 years of attainment of freedom as to what were the governing factors which got India her freedom. Of course, the last phase of Savarkarji's life was quite tragic. It was a Shakespearean fall of a hero. Uh, he was implicated in a murder case that he was not part of, uh, only because Godse was his one-time acolyte in uh, uh, the Hindu Mahasabha, Got, um, Godse as well as Narayan Apte and others. Um, Ambedkar is supposed to have very clearly said that this was a fixed match. Uh, I quote that episode in the book where Ambedkar, who was the law minister of India then, uh, this is post-independence, he calls up Savarkar's uh, uh, lawyer, Bhopatkar, and says, I want to talk to you. Let's meet. And they meet in Delhi's Mathura Road uh, junction where Ambedkar himself is driving the car. 
he asks bhopatkar to hop in and he says there is no case against your client uh, it has been fixed at the highest levels of government there is a lot of dissent within the government to uh, you know on this entire matter and your client will soon come out of it so don't worry and he also attended several of the court trial sessions the red fort trials that happened uh, for the gandhi murder for almost one year that he was arrested uh, for that so among all the people who got implicated of course badge digambar badge one of the accused became a approver and he was released but savarkar was the only one who was honorably exonerated from the court uh, because there was no clear indication of his involvement other than circumstantial evidence which was cooked up so but despite that there is a very telling letter that sardar patel wrote to uh, shama prasad mukherjee when the latter asked him you know he is an old man now uh, savarkar he has just suffered two heart attacks in 1946 uh, you know he has sacrificed so much for this country so be a little kind to him uh, you know when the legal process is happening and patel is supposed to have written back saying no there will be no political witch hunt against him legally he may be exonerated but the moral albatross of this murder will be on him and that exactly what happened the courts may have repeatedly exonerated him but the albatross of the being a accomplice of the gandhi murder somehow continues to fall on his neck which comes up all the time when there is a talk of granting the bharat ratna to him and so on the kapoor commission is spoken about which i have uh, dissected in detail in my book as to how those findings were not uh, accurate as recent as 2018 there was actually someone uh, a man called pankaj fadnis he goes to the supreme court uh, with a pil saying he wants to look into the matter uh, that savarkar's name has been implicated in the kapoor commission and the supreme court uh, puts an amicus curiae for an entire year and a half they go through all the documents of the red fort trials the kapoor commission and the supreme court uh, gives out a verdict that the petitioners assumption that savarkar was somehow involved in the murder is totally unfounded so i think when the highest court of the country too has given uh, has laid the matter to rest that unfortunately keeps on coming time and again in conclusion i would like to actually take you back to that to the essence of that this man that he was the sensitive poet despite the man of multiple contradictions a, a firebrand revolutionary who was also a sensitive poet how could the two twain actually meet uh, his sensitivity comes to fore when in when he is in london the whole india house has unraveled madanlal dhingra has been executed and savarkar along with uh, niranjan pal bipin chandra pal son they both are sitting on the sea shore in brighton uh, and that is when uh, you know he is seeing all the people having a gala time there vacationing with their family and so on and he starts sobbing uh, uncontrollably and niranjan pal writes in his memoirs which i quote in my book that involuntarily a poem and a song came out of his uh, um, you know mind and that was that me majasine parat matrabhumi la sagara pran talmalala where he shades the ocean saying that you know you cheated me you said you are going to bring me to this far away place where i uh, uh, will get all the vidya of the world um, to but what use is all this vidya if my mother back home is in shackles so uh, you have left my soul in talmal uh, you know pran talmal ho raha hai so this is the poem that he composed extemporaneously and that i think gives the essence of the patriotism the the manner in which his heart actually beat for mother india and unfortunately in contemporary politics uh, we we bring characters of history into that and make them a casualty make history a casualty today um, he is a part of raukas news debates where the nation wants to know whether he was a traitor whether he was a coward whether he was a brave man veer the, there are governments which are wasting time the rajasthan and chatisgarh uh, should his name be prefixed by veer or not uh, rahul gandhi uh, you know hurls epithets on him ranjit savarkar his grand nephew files a defamation case against him the prime minister is going to port blair and paying uh, respects to him in the cell 
all this is happening but in the midst of that when a young person i see several young people in the audience if they really want to know what is all this noise about who was this man what is uh, the true story of this man the last biography of savarkar was written in the 1960s when he was alive by dhananjay keer and after that he has become a persona non grata in society today a person like me is able to write a book of course the consequences i face for that are immense i uh, am constantly under fire from different quarters nationally and now even internationally but uh, this was only to be expected because uh, rashi ji mentioned pandit hridayanath mangeshkar it was the same hridayanath mangeshkar who tuned this sagara pran talmalala and he was then working in the all india radio and uh, he got a show cause notice for that saying why did you tune this poem and in a very nonchalant way mangeshkar said gave a two line reply great poem and a wonderful poet that should be reason enough to tune it but for that within a week he was sacked from all india radio so that was the 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 condition of savarkar and a study of his life his philosophy his thoughts post independence where a man who all his life ironically strove for removing untouchability becomes a political untouchable a social untouchable himself we are studying about him talking about him actually costs you your livelihood at least today itne to acche din aa gaye hain ki we are able to uh, write a book on him we are able to have a lecture on him and uh, there is of course the consequences court cases all of that which i people like me have to face because of this but nonetheless uh, the the dialogue is important i think i time and time and again say you may love the man you may hate the man that doesn't matter but your love or your hatred for a person needs to be informed it cannot be prejudiced uh, you know you learn about this person after reading these two volumes if someone still feels that savarkar was no good he was Uh, a traitor he was a stooge he was an assassin uh, all of these islamophobe whatever tags that, that come to mind today that's fine at least you are basing your assessment of a person on research on information not purvagraha you know the, you have a preconceived idea of what he has uh, lies calumny that i think should go and talks like this which organizations like prabuddha bharat uh, host go a long way in reaching out this message that let us understand this man it says a life in sacrifice and patriotism let us understand what this life was what was his message and then each of us are intelligent enough to make our own individual assessment there are some cases some parts of his life you may not agree i do not agree with everything he said and did so but then as i said let that be informed opinion about someone so once again thank you so much for being such a patient audience and hearing my monologue thank you so much to prabuddha bharat for inviting me thank you